I'm Alan Fry. I'm current president of the Texas Draft Horse and Mule Association. And I've uh, been with the association almost 20 years. And um, watched it grow and move around and it's changing and doing different things. We were all draft horses. Now we're getting in more driving horses, a lot more riding people. And um, but we still have a lot of people working their horses and that's what we're doing here today. We got close, probably about 80 members total. Um, active members, we probably got about 20, 25 active families, you know, that show up to all the events. The other ones are just members that just get the newsletter and pay attention to what we're doing. What do you do on your farm here? With, uh, with tractors and everything? What, what yeah. Do you do, what do you do here? It's mixed power, so I use tractors for a little bit, use the horses for a little bit as much as I can, and I raise some cattle and um, just the horses. So I'm just putting out hay with them and I plant, well, right now we're gonna plant some stuff and I plant in the fall, plant ryegrass and plow some up and disc some things. So most of your crops are forage? Yes. Okay. Yes, I don't, no hay. yeah, no hay. I buy all my hay. You buy all yeah. your hay? I just don't have room for it here. Okay, all right. So it's just as easy to buy it down the road. So what do you grow, you said you grow rye? I grow ryegrass for grazing during the winter. Okay, all Yeah, right. plant it in the fall and then they, they graze on it all winter, the cows and the horses both. And then what do you do with that ground in the summertime? Um, the hay or the the rye will die out as soon as it gets hot, about end of May, yep. and then the Bermuda grass will take over, okay. and, the, and the native grasses will take over. So then they have forage on the on the native grasses. And that you don't see, that just seeds itself. Yeah, that just seeds itself. Okay. Yeah, Bermuda has the runners, and it it'll right. take care of itself. Okay. Um, and how many of the members of the association do you think use their horses on their farm for actual work? Oh, there's probably I would say about five members. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a small number. Uh, most people just use them on trail rides and coming to these events and stuff like that. We have a few people farm as much as they can with them in the different areas. So. A lot of associations um, are top heavy with older folk. Yes. And don't have a lot of young folk coming up on it. Right. Um, is that true with your group? That's very true with our group. We have very few young folks and can't get them interested. They'll come out for a few years and then they'll disappear. And some of the own young folks that we do have, it's because their father or their grandfather is still in the association. So they're still hanging out with them. And we've got some been around for, you know, a good while or throughout their whole life. And um, they're in their 20s now and they're still hanging around with us. They're, they're then going to be able to glean some of that knowledge and experience from some of those older folks that have got horse experience. Yes. Yes, they're always learning experience and they're always learning from the older folks. You got a new team here. Yes, sir. Got a new team. Just got last Saturday. Bought them uh, up in Beeville over at the Amish auction. Actually, the, the halfling on the right I bought from the auction. And the one on the left I actually bought from the Amish people themselves. So, so you brought them both home same day? I brought them home that Saturday night. Sunday morning I woke up and harnessed them up, adjusted all the harnesses and took them out for a ride. Being there, not familiar with each other, being they came from two different places. Uh, hooked them up, let them stand a while, make sure they get used to themselves. And then I uh, hooked them up, put them on a wagon, I have a rubber tire covered wagon that we hooked up to. And then we rode around the barnyard to be safe inside a fenced in area. And after about 10, 15 times around the barnyard, around obstacles, around the barnyard where they turn left, right. Then I took off down the driveway. Went down the driveway and the end of my driveway got on the blacktop and just make from one side to the other, got them on the, where they feel the blacktop with them, see how they act around mailboxes. So I just went to the neighbors, turned around his driveway, came back, went back down my driveway. And back in the morning, I worked them a little time when I got confidence in them, turned around, headed up the driveway, picked up my wife, and we went on an hour ride, her and I, up down the road, brought her back. Then I turned around and went back and went out for about a five, hour, four hour ride. So and by the time that afternoon, they were calm. Can you talk a little bit about the versatility of the half oh. you, can, you can take it down the road. And yes. It can, can be alert and it can move out. Right. And you can also. I can plow with them. These half lingers are, are made for pulling, whether you're plowing or trail riding or just enjoying a Sunday afternoon. And that's mainly what I like to do. I like a Sunday afternoon. Harness them up, put them in a wagon. Me and my wife just, to me, when I'm hooked up behind it, riding in the wagon down the road, you know, just a city afternoon, to me it's very relaxing. I could do that all afternoon. And my wife loves it also, so that's usually on Sunday afternoon. 
I saw a Sunday afternoon ride, so I'd get in the car ride and hook up the horses and go for a, a luxury ride. But yet, you bring them a day like today, and they, they plow all day. They, and you know, just because they're strong don't mean they're tough. They're tough. They give out their hearts out to them, and that's that's what I like about them too, you know. They don't I, know how big they are. They don't know how big they are. They, they don't hardly have, I've never had one to give up. This is my third team I've had. So, and they're, they're I, I love them to death. I, I like how How are things going in the association? Going good. Our membership uh, is improving. I mean, the numbers are increasing. Debbie could probably give you more information about the numbers than I can, but okay. uh, uh, our events are, you know, really picking up, you know, with the number of people that are, that are showing. Uh, uh, we have uh, seemed like a lot more people are getting involved in where they're using the old uh, farm equipment and stuff like that. Uh, really not so much uh, parades anymore. We did, when we first got in the association, we was pretty good about making parades, you know, for the holidays and, you know, summertime parades, heritage parades and stuff like that. Uh, seemed like a lot of our members are really getting into the more the, the rural aspect of it, you know, with the old farm equipment. And uh, I've really gotten bit by the bug uh, last year. Uh, last year was my first trip to go to Waverly. and. Uh, I tell you what, I've uh, have spent numerous hours researching the old farm equipment and, and spending time, you know, with uh, the older guys in our association, you know, that has a lot of the knowledge and stuff, you know, that comes with this equipment. You know, I think it goes in, in, in spurts. You'll see a lot of our play days and stuff. Uh, uh, it's really geared up for people that are, are, that are riding in the drafts now. Uh, a lot of the play days are geared up for the riders. Uh, our field days and harvest days and stuff like that, you'll see the people that are actually uh, enjoying, you know, the old farm equipment and so on. Yeah. It's really a dying art and it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really up to us to continue the legacy. They're working pretty good for you today. Yeah, they're doing really well. This is a uh, uh, pair of seven-year-olds. They're a uh, half-brother and sister. This is Rook on the right. This is Raven on the left. Uh, yeah, they're they're doing really well. They uh they uh. You do more than just drive them on the weekend, or is that about it? That's about it. Uh, I work shift work, uh -huh. you know, so I'm off in the middle of the week and everything, and you know, have the opportunity, you know, to meet up, you know, with some of the guys that are retired, you know, maybe go out to their place and, you know, do some plowing and and disking and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really works out pretty good for me working shift work, so I can go out there, you know, when the uh, rest of the crowd ain't in the way and. Uh, pick up on some of the pointers you know from these guys. These are high flinger mules. Uh, I got them from a guy that raised them from Colts. He'd give me a whole dossier on them from, from the time they're this high all the way up. Give me the stud used, the, the jack used, papers on the mares and all that kind of stuff. And uh, He raised them from Colts and he did a fantastic job with them. They're just like big puppies. So they came to you broke? Yes sir. Uh -huh. Yes sir. They, he just trail rode with them so they drug wagon all the time. So. Stepping off into farm equipment's a little different deal for them. Right, right. Yep. They're doing good. I've drug disc with them quite a bit, and I started out there with a plow that I'd bought in Waverly and fixed up, and one of the springs gave out and it dropped, so I uh, figured if it was going to fight it, wasn't no sense trying that plow. So we're trying to get them going, and uh, just another way to use them. Do you find anything different about working with mules from when you used to work with horses? Well, I've never worked with horses with pulling horses either, so it's a different ball game. But uh, these things are pretty challenging. One of them is a Houdini. I've had to put latches on everything. He'll, if it can be open, he'll just about open it. And uh, they're curious, you know. They'll, they're in your pocket all the time if you're outside in the barn or something. And they'll, they'll go start opening drawers on my toolboxes and pulling tools out, looking in the drawer. They're, they're a hoot. They got a lot of personality. Yeah. But I say this is my first mule, so I've talked to a lot of people that's raised them and trained them and stuff, trying to learn, and they tell me that either a mule likes people or they don't. But if they don't, you don't want them. Uh, tell me about your team. Yeah, I want to do that. Well, they're either six and seven or seven and eight. <laughs> you know, they're young. Are uh, they related? You know? You don't know. They come from two different places, but I've been working and breaking suffolks for sickles. 
I break several horses every year, so. So you break these are you, you're breaking team. Yeah. You I break. You prefer better than the other one, or to break with another well, horse? Well, if yeah, if if I got one that's wild, I'm gonna put it with my old Geldy. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, like one of them, the Suffolk's that I'm breaking right now. For a quarter mile, he bucked. You know, time we left the fence. And I was glad I had my big horse with him because he busted the double tree. It was wooden, and uh, we had stay chains on it. And we was able to get back and put another set of double trees on. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? You on a sled? I was on a wagon. A wagon. I use a wagon all the time with hydraulic brakes. Brakes. Okay. Is it heavy? Pretty good. Yeah. It's not real heavy because. Okay. I don't want a real heavy wagon because if the horse you're using has got to pull the whole outfit and the horse that's with him, uh, I don't want to wear him out. Right. Yeah. And about, I spend a half hour, 45 minutes out in the field doing circles and figure eights and talking to them. And, and then I, I usually I'll work them four miles the first time. And then, progressively get more. Like I like them. You like a tall? Yeah, I like big horses. You know. I like perching horses. Yeah. Uh, I like to sell the Suffolks. They sell a little easier than the perching. But, more but rare. I don't really want to sell these. Yeah. I mean, I would if someone would give me enough money. I'll horse. sell them. <laughs> I'm not married to them. Yeah. But I, I, I'll keep these for a while, I'm afraid. Well, I've been secretary for probably about eight to 10 years now, and I am in charge of keeping everybody organized. We um, send out emails primarily, and now with Facebook and email technology, we're really about um, emailing every week something, reminding people of events that we have, and we use that a lot for uh, selling, buying and selling horses and equipment. When people are looking for something, they email me and then I email it out to the group. We have maybe eight or ten people now that still do snail mail as we call it and have to uh, mail out to them. We've got about 90, 95 members now so the group when I started had about 60 so we've crept up a little at a time. I think it's hard to get new members mainly because of the cost of all the equipment. A lot of people will get the horses and we've got more riding now than we used to but that's because it's easier to do and it takes them a while to get into the driving and the harnessing and that sort of thing. That's one of our, um, probably one of our bigger issues with getting membership. We've probably got a core group of about 25 to 30 people that uh, make all the events. And then we've got people scattered as far as West Texas, the Panhandle and such. And so that's probably one of the biggest complaints that we get is why isn't there an event near me? And we have to say, we'll sponsor one and we'll, we'll make it happen. But we have the, the regular group that does the events and we try to keep it as central as we can. It's a little more South Central right now. Your mom runs a, a livery service or a... She runs a carriage business. Okay. And we have a carriage, we can do weddings. Um, we mostly do horse-drawn uh, funeral services. That's what we do a lot of. And for those, you've got, um, you got spotted drafts? Or? Yes, I have spotted drafts. They're black and white. Their names are Jack and Jill. And we also have a black and a white hearse. Okay. And now you've gotten into Suffolk. Yes, I've gotten into Suffolk. And can you explain how that started and how, how many you got now? <laughs> well, it's actually kind of a funny story. I, my mom kind of got me involved with them. Rodney Reed sent an, uh, an ad out to the club asking somebody to help halt or train three yearling Suffolk. And of course, my mom volunteered me for that. And so I went and um, I met Rodney. And the deal was if you help Rodney, you can get one of the Suffolk. So I was like, okay. I was like, well, I don't need a horse. I've got enough horses. As, you know, I don't need another Suffolk. Well, I didn't have any Suffolk at the time. I didn't even know really what Suffolk were. Well, I happened to fall in love with one of the suffix there, Quentin, and I told Rodney, I was like, look, I said, I know I said I didn't need any horses, but I got to have this horse. He's like, all right, you can have him. And so now I helped him halter train all three, and 
now I have a total of six Suffix. They're all from Rodney, and I've halter trained them, and I'm driving two of them today, and I've got four of them that are in training now to drive. And so, what do you do with them at home? Do you just work them? Do you, do you farm with them at all? Um, right now, um, I don't get to do a whole lot with them, mainly because I'm still in school. I'm a college student at Sam Houston State. And so if I come home on the weekends, it's normally like to help my mom for a job. And then if, I, if we're not doing a job, I'll get to drive that weekend, depending on what we have planned. Okay. What do you like about Suffolk? I like their size. Um, I like their disposition, how calm they can be. And really just, I think they're just a great breed overall. I like their characteristics. Uh -huh. Somebody getting into draft horses, would you recommend Suffolk to them? Yes, I think so. Because I think they're a very easy breed to work with mm -hmm. and learn with. I mean, I don't, I think they're good horses. Sure. What are you going, yeah. you've seen this club change a lot probably. Oh, tremendous. What was it like when you joined it? It was a lot of farm people. Uh-huh. Now it's a lot of trail riders. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, it's totally, totally different type of person now. You shod horses for a living, saddle horses mostly? Yeah, a lot of draft horses, but Did mostly you? saddle horses. Okay. All right. yeah. Did you grow up on a farm? No, I grew up in New York City. Really? Yeah. I'll be darned. I left there the day after I graduated high school. And came where? Here? I went, I went up to New York State, northern New York State, <laughs> and worked on a dairy farm. Then, then I moved to Connecticut. So when you lived in New York City, you lived in, in the city itself? You lived Bronx. You lived in the Bronx? Mm -hmm. hmm. And your parents stayed there after you left, and you'd go back oh, yeah. every once in a while they, to visit them? For the day. And you didn't miss it? <laughs> no way. They had to force me to come visit them. <laughs> you always wanted to be in the country? I hated it down there. I went from New York to Connecticut, from Connecticut to Texas. Okay. All I right. moved here in 78. All right. And were you shoeing horses in Connecticut? Yes, but not as many because I had a lot of other things going. Okay. Were you farming then or working for I was for a farming farm? and I had two school buses. You drove bus? I owned them. You owned them, okay. You had drivers working for you and you maybe drove Me two. and my wife mainly, and then I hired drivers while I needed time off to farm. Pe people always need a horseshoe. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you show up when you say you're going to show up, you're going to stay busy. Yeah, yeah. You know? You must have seen a lot of young people try their hand at horseshoeing and oh, have yeah. trouble making a go yeah, of it. Yeah, a lot of it. My brother was a horseshoer for years, yeah. and, and it's, you got to be pretty frugal being a horseshoer, don't you? Yeah, real frugal. Yeah, you got to be careful with your money. Yep. Because people, the other thing I noticed with him was that he spent more time teaching the horse owner than he did teaching the horse how to behave. Yeah, the owners, for the most part, are pretty, pretty slow. Yeah. You know, I want to of course, say they're stupid, but they're, they're slow, you know. They're, they're hard to teach them anything. Yep. They think they know quite a bit. So. And, they, and they don't pick up their horse's feet. No, and no, they, they want you to do it. Right, yeah. yeah. I remember going on stops with him. The horse would be in the pasture with mud on it, and the guy would say, there's the horse that I want you to shoot. And then you get in the truck and go home. Right, right. You only have to do that once. Yeah, right, right, it's true. Mm -hmm.